Do I have this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The important job these three guys do up in the balcony there, keeping everything rolling. Thank you. Well, how y'all are? Good to see you. Those of you who may not know it, on my father's side, I'm a Cajun from South Louisiana, and I tell stories of things down there. With well, T-Boy, that means little boy, T-Boy Guidry, he was born and his mama and papa, so I'm proud of that boy. They have several other kids, but T-Boy don't say nothing. They can't get him to talk. They took him to doctors. He don't say anything. It's getting almost time for him to start kindergarten. What are we going to do? One Saturday morning, they sitting there at the breakfast table. All of a sudden, T-Boy say, oatmeal's lumpy. They say, you can talk, you can talk. He said, yeah. Well, how come you hadn't said anything? He said, up to now, everything been okay. <laughs> so that's the way it is down there. Turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Romans the 8th chapter. Romans the 8th chapter. Paul's been writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Talking about the victory we have with the new law. We have a new Lord when you trust Jesus. You have new life and it's victory. He talked about sonship and he goes on talking about security that we have. But today, if you will, we're going to focus in on some verses beginning in verse 18. If you're able to stand, would you stand out of respect for the reading of the word? Thank you. Now I consider that the suffering of this present time, sufferings of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits or waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that, we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. May we pray. Almighty Father, I thank you for your blessings, for your goodness to us. And I pray that you'll speak to each of our hearts, meet the needs of hearts. Lord, where there are folks that need conviction, may this be felt. Where we need comfort, may this be felt. Where we need to be aware of your presence, may people be aware of this. Where there's sickness, your hand of healing. Where there's distress, comfort. Oh Lord, I pray that you'll meet the needs of each person here. In the mighty name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, please be seated.
This rich book, the book of Romans, speaks to our hearts. It's the most doctrinal book in the Bible. It is so solid with things. It's special to me because the preacher was preaching from the book of Romans, the Roman road, when I got saved. But this book talks about something here, speaks about groanings. In several cases, the word is used about groanings. Now, what in the world is the Bible speaking about groanings? Well, it's important because it wouldn't be there. But we need to just see the pattern here. The very first thing he talked about was why is creation groaning? We need to ask ourselves that. Why? Why does the scripture say it's groaning? Well, it wasn't like that in the beginning. God created everything perfect and good. But something happened to create the groanings and that is the fall. The fall of man brought with sin brought pain, suffering, sickness, thorns, all kind of problems came. Paul compared it with a woman who's in labor to bring forth a child. But creation itself Realizing that things are out of harmony with what God created it for. And by the way, he created it. Don't ever doubt that. He created it. And he created this world. But man, by the way, that, that was my ancestor and yours that messed up. But that's not my excuse for all that sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Folks, I hate to say it. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, the Bible said. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Praise God for Jesus Christ, for salvation. The groaning of creation reminds us of the seriousness of sin. We got a sin problem. We all have a sin problem. I pray you, you've put it under the blood, but you do still have a sin problem. Now, why are Christians groaning? You'd think, well, we have nothing to groan about. Our sins have been forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. What a Savior. What a Lord. Something to get excited about. He's on his throne and he saves. But also, our sins were through faith forgiven because of what he did. We are justified and have peace with God. Hallelujah. We're assured of a place in heaven. So heaven is now my future home, it's yours if you're a believer. Amen. What an exciting thing as I read about heaven and realize that's where we'll spend eternity with the Lord and with our loved ones who have died in Christ. Not who have died, but who have died trusting in faith in Jesus Christ. So why do we groan? Well, Paul has already talked about some of this earlier. He got in, in over an earlier chapter there talking about how miserable because we're in a sinful flesh. We still have a sin problem. It's unfortunate. But we do. The longer I go, the more I realize my failures, my sins, and more thankful I am for the forgiveness through Jesus. They're the sins we commit. Sins of commission, sins of omission, the things we fail to do. To him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. The Bible shows us it is sin. We're part of this sinful race. We still experience, we still experience suffering, 
sickness, pain, death, just like others who are without Christ. We still suffer these things. But the realization that, that God has something far better for us, far better our flesh is convicting us to sin, but the Spirit convicts us against sin. And we need to continually bring that to the Lord. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, Paul speaks about this. And this passage over here. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. That within us, there's this thing wanting that's so much better that God has for us. Now it's not up to us to speed it up. We put this in God's hands. We trust God. We know God. So we want to do it God's way. We want to be what God wants us to be. Now, we groan because we know that better day is coming. It's an anticipation of the resurrection of this body. And he says, uh, anticipation of the adoption being completed when our bodies will be made perfect. We're adopted because faith in Jesus Christ. But that adoption is finalized. Our name's in the book of life. But when we get our new body, when we're with the Lord, and sin no more has a problem for us. So then that brings us to why is the Spirit groaning? We read about that. The Holy Spirit helps us in our poor praying. Say, so wait a minute, what? Poor praying. Well, the Bible speaks about that we ask and receive not because we ask amiss. So many times, our praying is not what it should be. Does that mean we're not to pray? No. We're to pray. Let the Holy Spirit do the guiding when we do make mistakes. We're often so short sighted in our prayer life. We're short-sighted. We pray in the flesh. Our flesh, our fleshly desires for things. We, we're short-sighted and distracted. We don't see the end goal because we can't see everything. But God knows what's right around the corner for you, for me. He knows the crisis of our lives. And so often, we miss the whole point. That's why the Holy Spirit's there to intercede for us. Sometime we, we hadn't been able to express everything to God like we need to. Reminds me of the story I read of this little girl that was born deaf and mute. Her mother died in childbirth. Her father reared her. He loved her. He doted on her. And she loved him intently and didn't know how to express it. The father had to go to Europe for a year. So he finally had to put her in an institution for people with deafness, disability. And she learned to speak during this time. When she came, when he arrived home, she came to greet him. She put her arms around him and she said, Daddy, I love you. Those words were music to his ears. They were magical. He praised God for this, that she could express herself now. Sometimes we can't express ourselves 
to God. To express our love for him. Well, Lord, I love you, but then we turn around and fail him. Our sins I mentioned of omission and commission. There's also presumptuous sins the Bible speaks about where we just presume on the Lord. We presume that things are his will without praying through them. Without seeing, Lord, is that what you really want in my life? We need to pray to him intently. Lord, what do you want? Speak in my heart. And Lord, direct my words. Pray for me. The Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings. They can't be uttered. He helps us in our infirmities, the Bible says. Our weaknesses. Our weaknesses. So often. And he words our request. He takes them, the things we've brought to the Lord, and he'll say, Father, this is what this person's really praying for. This is what he polishes them up for us. The things that are upon our heart. Now the Holy Spirit knows what's best for us and not just what's good. Billy Graham has used the illustration of this noted preacher that he had known in time past that this preacher was being honored. He was pastor of a large church not far from the seminary the man had gone to. He had been there many years. Well, they're having a big day to honor him. Folks from his seminary were there. Folks from his church was there. His wife and family was there. After they honored him, they gave him a chance to speak. And he said, I, I, I want to tell y'all, I asked God for a woman to marry. I asked God for a church that I wanted to pastor. I asked God to let me go to such and such a seminary and God said no in all three cases. Everybody was aghast. Oh, my goodness. He said, but God gave me a far better wife, a far better church, and a far better school to go to. Sure. That's what God will do. See, we think we know what's best for us. But God sometimes has to say no. It's, it's kind of like this knuckle-headed guy that I know real well. When he was a boy, and his daddy went to a baseball game to see the Baton Rouge Red Sticks play the New Orleans Pelicans. That was years ago. When it was over, his daddy said, well, look, why don't we go to, and there was this one place that fixed great po' boys. Oh, yeah. I said, I want an oyster po' boy. Oh, I told you who it is, didn't I? <laughs> who that clown was. But I said, I want an oyster po' boy. I want one of the large ones. Oh, boy, they could fry those oysters so good. My dad said, son, I think you really need the small one. I said, oh, no, dad, I want that large one. Well, he let me get that large one. Boy, I devoured it. It was so good. I started getting kind of full, but I wasn't going to let him know because he said, you really need the smaller one, so I ate every bit of it. We got home, and I got sick. And folks, it was 20-something years later. Joanna and I were at a restaurant. She said, try these oysters. I said, I hadn't been able to eat an oyster for years. Well, I tried it, and it was good, and I'm back eating them. But my goodness, you see, he gave me what I shouldn't have. God, many times knowing and as a loving father says, no, you're not ready for this. You need to do it my way. I know what's best for you. And what a Holy Spirit we have 
who knows what's best for us, who intercedes, he teaches us also what to pray for as we grow in our Christian life. You know, that's why I love that little acrostic about prayer. The word A-C-T-S, acts. If you spend time, A, adoring the Lord, telling him how great he is. C, telling God how sinful, that's confession, we are. And then T, thanking him for all he's done and especially for salvation. When you get to the SS of supplications, then all those little things that aren't important that we wanted to ask for, that's not important. I can't ask the Lord for that. I just need to thank Him for forgiveness and ask Him to bless in other people's lives and save people, intercede. All those selfish things go by the wayside. That's, that's a reassuring thing. And the Holy Spirit makes our praying far more effective. In case you're wondering, now where does Jesus come in with this? Book of Hebrews 7th chapter and 1 John 2, 1 tell us, Jesus is interceding for us. When we go before the Lord, he is saying, Father, that's one of mine. When we sin, Father, put it under my blood. Put it under my blood. That's one of mine interceding for us. Oh, he's there. And the Father grants his request. And he hears what the Holy Spirit says through us and for us. Now one of the things we must gain from this, one of the takeaways, is God wants us to pray earnestly. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to be in prayer. We need continually to confess our sins. He wants to bless in us. And the Holy Spirit stands ready to help our prayers. But you know, if you hadn't spoken a prayer, He can't intercede. He can't adjust our prayers. There are times we don't know what to say, but we go before the Lord and say, Lord, work your work. Speak through my heart and the Holy Spirit does it. He directs. He takes our good intentions and fleshes them out. But the important thing about all of it is to be in prayer. That we pray to the Lord. This morning I don't know where you are spiritually. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I beg you Please make that decision. Don't leave this place without knowing that you know Jesus. Please make that decision. Make it public, unashamed. If your membership's elsewhere and you're not serving the Lord in the church, you need to move that membership here. Be a part of things. Serve Him. It's Jesus church he died for the church it belongs to him not us and he wants to you to be a part of it and working serving him if you find that you are backslidden in some way repent of it commit yourself anew maybe God's called you to some special service you answer that call but be obedient to the Lord in everything. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit's groanings on our behalf. May we pray. Almighty Father, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your goodness. Oh Lord, I thank you for Jesus. 
truly, Lord, there is something about that name. That name above every name. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. Lord, I, I pray that you'll work in hearts now. Whoever needs to make a decision, may they make it public. Work your work. And Lord, may we be obedient to you. In the mighty and wonderful name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.